A German soldier sits in a muddy trench hoping for a hiatus in what's been constant shelling for hours. Unbeknownst to him, noxious gas wafting over no man's land will be over him soon. The so-called king of battle gases is about to change his life forever. Some years later, the Nazis didn't want to see a repeat of this. All sides during the First World War used mustard gas. It was potent and very effective in hurting your enemy, even when gas masks were worn. When they weren't being worn, soldiers would sometimes report smelling burned garlic or rubber or even dead horses. That's when they knew they were in trouble. The gas was also said to smell like horseradish, hence why it got the name mustard gas. You might have thought until now that soldiers were throwing pots of spicy Hellman's mustard at each other, but the gas was actually a bunch of pernicious chemical compounds, not a delicious condiment. If inhaled in vast quantities, the soldier was always going to have a very bad day. The effects of the gas were not immediate, but if breathed in, there was no way out. At first, the victim's eyes would tear. This would intensify until it became very painful, sometimes leading to temporary blindness. Make no mistake, mustard gas could kill, but in warfare, almost blinding a complete regiment was certainly a way to get ahead. It also produced blisters on a soldier's skin, which weren't just irritable. They often popped and turned into oozing wounds, therefore putting the soldier at risk of getting a dangerous infection. If that wasn't bad enough, there were long-term effects of exposure. One of them was cancer. It was hard to get away from the stuff since it stuck to clothes. A soldier's body could then be severely burned, bad enough to cause immense pain, disfigurement, and over time death. This is how a wartime British nurse explained treating soldiers injured by mustard gas. They cannot be bandaged or touched. We cover them with a tent of propped up sheets. Gas burns must be agonizing because usually the other cases do not complain even with the worst wounds, but gas cases are invariably beyond endurance and they cannot help crying out. Bear in mind, we're about to tell you how the Nazis used this gas on prisoners. There were other milder long-term effects too, as the British soldier Cecil Withers explained after the war. I suffer badly from phlegm and from coughs and colds a lot. That all started when the British were shelling hard at the last Battle of Soma. One of the shells distributed the residue of mustard gas that had been lying there for months. They talk about secondary smoking, I got secondary gas. Mustard gas didn't just blister the skin, it also blistered the lungs. In a bad case, the end result was pulmonary edema and sometimes death. In fact, just to give you a better idea of how dangerous this stuff was, making the shells in factories injured and killed people in Germany, Britain, France, and the US, the country that ended up making the most mustard gas weapons. One paper we found on this topic said, the most dangerous job regardless of location involved filling artillery gas shells. This produced even more injuries than normal chemical production, and German workers suffered as much as British, French, and American workers. As you can see, mustard gas was a useful weapon, albeit some folks thought it was unethical. Others said, hey, if you can blow a man's head off and shove a bayonet through his heart, why can't you kill him slowly with gas? The typical British response to mustard gas must have been, it's just not cricket, meaning it's not how things were done. Obviously, supporters of the gas likely never went within 100 miles of a trench. Mustard gas was first used by German troops on July 12, 1917, near Ypres, Belgium. The victims of the gas were British and Canadian soldiers. Chemical weapons were nothing new at the time, all sides were using them, but it was the Germans that got ahead with the king of battle gases. US soldiers also suffered once they were in the war in 1917. Harry L. Gilchrist, medical director of the gas service, US Army Expeditionary Force, wrote about what happened to some US troops hit with the gas. He said, at first the troops didn't notice the gas and were not uncomfortable, but in the course of an hour or so there was marked inflammation in their eyes. They vomited. Later there was severe blistering of the skin, especially where the uniform had been contaminated. The men were virtually blind and had to be led about. On top of that, not knowing when some gas would waft into them really messed up soldiers' minds. Many suffered from kinds of PTSD called gas fright. By the time the war had finished, untold numbers of men suffered from psychological conditions. While only around 90,000 men died from chemical agents, about 1.3 million suffered gas injuries. Ok, so you don't need much more convincing that mustard gas was a formidable weapon that not only set back an army but also ruined a man's life. That's why the Germans were so dead set on trying to create something to protect their soldiers during the next war. But as you know, the Nazis didn't exactly wait for the German equivalent of FDA approval before using an agent. They also didn't have too many scruples about human testing during experimental trials. That's because they had concentration camps full of people they deemed enemies and generally just inferior to their master race. These people they thought were entirely expendable. They could be tested on, pulled apart, frozen, and when they did, they were useful for autopsy purposes. As always, years later, when it came to experimentation, everything had to go through Adolf Hitler's number one man. 
the guy said to be the architect of the Holocaust, Heinrich Himmler. Some of the letters written to him were discovered after the Nazis were beaten. We found one written by Ernst Robert Grawitz, a physician to Hitler and before that someone who was part of Nazis' mass euthanasia program. He also took part in experiments in which he tried to cure homosexuality. In the letter, he talked about experimenting with the N substance. This referred to chlorine gas, not mustard gas, which was very useful during the previous war, albeit not too effective when the enemy donned its gas masks. This is part of the original letter in translation. In accordance with these investigation experiments carried out on the 25th of September 1944, the necessity has now arisen to carry out several experiments on human beings for the final clarification of the physiological effect of N substance on and through human skin. He asked for five prisoners, stating that it was improbable that the experiment will cause any permanent damage. The Nazis maimed and killed many people in various experiments, so we don't know why exactly Grawitz stated that part. We do know such experiments were kept secret as much as possible from the people in the camps, and we also know that injured persons did not make good workers. We found another letter written by Grawitz again to Himmler, but this time about something called the Lost Program. Lost was a kind of sulfur gas. It got the name from two people that invented it, Wilhelm Lemmel and Wilhelm Steinhaus. The prisoners had already been purposefully injured by the gas, and the experiment consisted of trying to treat them, just as any German soldier would require medical help on the battlefield. The letter states, The persons experimented on suffered considerably under the wound caused by Lost. The arms in most of the cases are badly swollen and the pains are enormous. In four cases the wounds became infected. We then find out that Drug H did nothing to help the specific wounds caused by Lost. Drug H was otherwise known as the Holzman remedy. The emphasis when using Lost was usually to burn the prisoner with the stuff until the horrible blisters formed. The Nazis then treated the burns with various drugs. Evidence tells us this happened at Sachsenhausen camp in 1939, at Natzweiler camp from 1942 to 1944, and at Neuengamme camp only in 1944. Also, as you already know, just making the shells that carried the gas was dangerous business, so the Nazis of course sometimes used camp inmates to do just that. On September 8, 1939, Polish troops hit German troops with mustard gas after blowing up a bridge at a place called Jaslo. Fourteen German soldiers were injured and two died. According to one researcher, the incident immediately led to an investigation by German chemical warfare experts. The Nazis were somewhat upset, so they took 31 prisoners and experimented on them. They did this at Sachsenhausen camp, which was mainly used for German political prisoners and Soviet prisoners. But other nationalities stayed and died there too. About 12,000 men died there from malnutrition and disease. Others were just shot or died in experiments. We know the prisoners suffering from mustard gas experiments were treated with the experimental drug Freskin, a powder codenamed F-1000 and F-1001. We also know various ointments were used for their infections. What we don't know is what happened to most of these guinea pigs. One survivor tells a story though. He was Hans Kargel, a German political prisoner. Kargel was a prominent anti-fascist in Germany, and so the Nazis convicted him of high treason and labeled him as an enemy of Hitler. He later wrote that at the camp he had a yellow liquid pasted over his arms. This was a liquid form of mustard gas. He said he came out in painful blisters which then became open wounds. He was then treated with two ointments, which caused intense pain. The Nazi doctors recorded the healing process with photographs and film. Later, another eight prisoners suffered a similar fate, but two of them had Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and Pneumococcus bacteria rubbed into the open wounds. This is what a researcher wrote about that. The infected prisoners developed sepsis with high temperatures, shivering, swelling of the glands, and enlarged spleens. The prisoners' suffering led to the insight that neither Holzman's remedy nor the Freskin powder had any healing effect on the mustard gas wounds or the infections. Ok, so the experiment failed. The Nazis tried again, of course. They also performed more experiments with the substance lost. One gram of it was smeared under the arms of several prisoners. So much of it was applied to them that their wounds became necrotic, although it seems the Nazis were able to treat those. Later at the Natzweiler camp, things went a little different. Lost was still applied to prisoners, but now a Dr. August Hurt treated the prisoners by giving them injections of vitamins. He's better known for his Jewish skeleton collection experiments. He also stood out having severe facial injuries from fighting in the first war. On November 25, 1942, 15 inmates were picked out for testing. 
It turns out that the earlier tests done on animals were not applicable to humans. The application for vitamin A had worked on rats, but in humans it actually made the wounds worse. Then they conducted what they called a major rat experiment using 1,000 rats and 4 different vitamins. Humans came next, 15 of them. They were all German political prisoners, according to Hendrik Nails, a former Dutch inmate. All suffered terrible festering wounds over their entire bodies. Some of them went blind, three died in horrible pain just after, and two more died within a few days. The reason for death was edema of the lungs or pneumonia. Hurt then wrote up his report stating that vitamins A, B complex, and C by mouth seemed to work, as did vitamin B1 when injected with glucose. What he totally left out of the report were the severe injuries, the extreme pain, and the deaths. The Nazis also experimented with phosgene gas, which is similar to mustard gas. In June 1943, up to 150 prisoners at Notzweiler camp were dosed with some of this thin gas, and around 50 of them suffocated in agony, although apparently scholars debate this today. More experiments happened, often using German prisoners, but also gypsy prisoners taken from another camp. They were gassed, and then doctors gave them a drug called Eurotropin orally, while others got nothing and some received injections of Eurotropin. A survivor named Willy Hertzberg said he and others were led to the gas chamber where a Nazi doctor threw vials on the floor and smashed them with his feet. He then walked out and the doors were locked. In about 10 minutes, Hertzberg said that all he could hear was muffled splashing caused by what he assumed was bursting lungs. He said prisoners were on all fours, writhing around with foam coming out of their mouths. As for himself, he said the pain was as if someone was sticking needles into his lungs. He said on his chest he felt a pressure, as if hundreds of kilos were put upon it. Fourteen people suffered pulmonary edema, four German gypsy inmates died, they were Zirko Rebstock, 37, Adalbert Eckstein, 20, Andreas Holdowski, 32, and Joseph Reinhardt, 38. As terrible as it was, it was a result for the Nazis who worked out just how much Eurotropin could be used to limit the effects of usually lethal phosgene poisoning. We now come to the last experiments. These were conducted by Ludwig Werner Haas at the Neuengamme camp. He was trying to develop a drug that would help German soldiers who'd been poisoned with the blister agent Lewisite. It also caused terrible burns that festered and got infected, but if soldiers swallowed the stuff, which was very possible, they could be looking at severe internal tissue damage after painful bouts of vomiting. Haas wrote to Himmler and Himmler gave him the green light to start testing on prisoners. Notably, Haas was one of Hitler's favorite physicians. Haas believed that adding hypochlorous acid to water could have a positive effect on men poisoned with lewisite. First, he had to see what happened when men drank water with hypochlorous acid in it. He had the water supply contaminated and 10,000 prisoners drank the water. They were all okay. This was progress. So then the doctor and his associates took 150 men and laced their water with lewisite. They drank that and then had to drink water with hypochlorous acid in it to see if it affected their perhaps rapidly declining health. Other experiments used nitrogen mustard as the poison. According to research, low doses of these poisons in the water didn't seem to damage the unwitting prisoners. Haas then said he wanted to give the prisoners high, harmful doses and others smaller doses to work out the right amount of hypochlorous acid to put in the water. To this, Himmler actually said no. His reason was the current situation. That was the advancing Allied troops in Germany soon to lose the war. And that just about covers the chemical agent experiments at the camps. Now you need to watch deadliest chemical weapons in the world, or have a look at weapons even the military made illegal.